Hello, everybody. I'm Alan Shaw, and I'm going to talk about state charts in the reframe environment. Suppose we're using React, Reagent, and Reframe. Our DOM is a pure function of our state. Our app is reactive. Our data is immutable and in just one place. And we don't have to synchronize state among various components. We can even do time travel debugging. All cool. So what's the problem? State? I thought that was covered. In Clojure, we're accustomed to dealing explicitly with state. If statements, or in our favorite languages, if expressions, cond expressions, cond p expressions. We don't have to write code to set state in various places, but we still need to check various bits of the app DB in order to make decisions. So rather than representing the state of the app by a multitude of flags and vars, it's better to make the states themselves explicit. We need a way to bundle the appropriate bits of state into these discrete bundles, states. And the problem goes away. States ensure that the UI can only accept valid events and that in response, the correct actions are performed. A state defines the set of events the user can provide. It expresses a constraint on the behavior of the system. Imagine you're coding a calculator in a nice repl bottom-up way. How do you handle the minus button? What is its meaning? Is it a subtract subtraction operator? Or does it indicate a negative number? Clearly, this depends not only on the input, but also on the app's history up to the time of the button press. This is when errors tend to happen, when the interpretation of an event depends on the context or mode or state in which it occurs. We can apply state techniques to modeling a system when its behavior can be partitioned into finite non-overlapping chunks. At one extreme are idempotent functions whose state never changes. At the other extreme are continuous functions such as digital filters that have too many states to contemplate. States are an abstraction of the app's history up to the time of an event. You probably know about finite state machines. You had them in school, if you read blog posts about them, you're probably not using them in your projects. Finite state machines have applications in so many different fields, avionics, embedded systems, games, user interfaces, of course. You could say they're reactiver than React itself. And they're characterized by four things, state, transition, event, and actions. So let's take a look at a candy machine that sells 20 cent candy, only takes nickels and dimes, five and 10 cent pieces, and gives no change. The double circle in the bottom right indicates the accept state. This is the state in which a candy is actually dispensed. We have states, the various circles in here, events, the coins that are entered, transitions, the arrows that take us from one state to another, and actions, which are not even indicated on here, the action of dispensing the candy. This is good. It describes our control system in a nice graph structure. So what's the problem? Ack, here's the problem. Here's a state diagram for a so-called cheap calculator used in an intermediate programming course at Rice University. It doesn't even have a minus button or a divide button, but it's already getting out of hand. I don't really want to read this diagram. The problem is complexity. Too many states, too many transitions, it's not scalable. And it doesn't have any way of describing concurrency. We'll talk about each of these. Complexity, as, as a system grows larger, every valid combination of parameters can potentially define a distinct state. And transition explosion, many states may have identical handlers for the same event. Let's think about that calculator. Whenever I hit the clear button, I want the same thing to happen, basically. I want everything to be removed, no matter which state I'm in. We'll see how to deal with that with state charts. 
State charts are an improvement over uh, finite state machines themselves because they're hierarchical and they're orthogonal. We'll talk about those in a moment. They ha you are able to declare state entry and exit actions regardless of which transition took you there or which transition is taking you out of the state. You're allowed to declare variables and guards of a state. So these mediate event responses. So for example, I want to transition from one state to another if a certain condition is true and otherwise not. Um, used sparingly, variables and guards can greatly simplify the state charts. Too many of them, though, can defeat the very purpose of using state machines because that takes us back in the direction of the previous design without states. And finally, internal transitions, they're there for completeness. Uh, that's why they're called transitions. Even though no change of state is, is invoked, it's different from a transition out of a state and back to itself because of the state entry and exit actions that are not performed in this case. Okay, hierarchical, hierarchical nested states. When we have a tree structure of states, uh, we, we implement this by means of bubbling. If the current leaf state, which I'll describe in a moment, does not handle a particular event, it bubbles up to the super state and so on. This allows the complexity of the, of the diagram to remain proportional to that of the system it describes. Let's take a look at this. Charles Petzold, in his famous book, Programming Windows 95, described the ultimate hook pattern. You have an app which implements specific behavior and the system which implements default behavior. A function call comes into the app, and if the app itself does not handle it, it passes it back up to the system. In this way, we can have apps implement the proper look and feel of our Windows 95 system without having to declare anything itself about that. The ultimate hook pattern appears throughout our front-end programming lives. Here are some examples. I think it should be pretty clear. In object-oriented programming, we have a hierarchical is a relationship. But in state charts, it's a slightly different. It implies an is in relationship. If an app is in a state, it is also in all of that state's super states. Now the other part, the concurrency, orthogonal regions. We're allowed to declare subsystems of an app or of a super state, which are more or less independent and have their own internal state, but they can communicate by events. Here we see a somewhat smarter vending machine expressed with hierarchical states and orthogonal states from the website of National Instruments, who sell a graphical programming tool that includes state charts. Here we have the top level state, which is the entire slide, the vending machine state chart. We have initial states. You see the black spot at the upper left with the arrow coming in to uh, the state. That indicates that the large rectangle is the initial state that the state chart goes into. We do have one other state at the very bottom, the error state, which is the other state of the overall thing. And within that, we have initial transitions that take us into the initial states of the subcomponents. We have a guard in the very center of the chart we have a transition from count coins to dispense, which is only executed when the T2 event occurs and the number of the amount of the coins totals over $1. We have transitions at different levels and we have orthogonal regions. So for example, the vending substate and the temperature control substate. They're independent subsystems and that represents an AND operation. When we have an ordinary state chart as our low levels, uh, ordinary state machine, excuse me, as our lower level charts in this chart are, they're allowed to be in only one state at a time. It's actually an exclusive or, but when we have independent orthogonal regions, that's an and. The app as a whole is in all of those states at the same time. So with this arrangement, the state charts, we conquer the explosion of states 
that would be required in an ordinary state diagram. But that is a side effect. The hierarchy itself is the state chart's most powerful feature. As we will see a little later, another side effect is the ability to easily enhance or modify the app. So now let's talk about reframe. As the README says, it's MVC gym, but not as we know it. The difference is that for the MV and C roles, reframe prefers functions over objects. Here's another uh, slide from the README itself. To build a reframe app, you design your app's data structure. Great, the data layer is data. Write and register subscription functions, the query layer, functions. Write reagent component functions, the view layer, functions. Write and register event handler functions, functions. Where it says control layer and, and or state transition layer, these are Reframe's own words in the README. In fact, it recommends using state charts. So let's look at what we're doing. To build a restate app, <laughs> which is Reframe plus Stately. Stately is my state library. You do all the same things except instead of event handler functions, you create a state chart. So now we have data, functions, functions, and data as our fourth component, data. And we all know data are greater than functions. The reframe data flow looks like this. And we have uh, over on the right, the DOM generates events, which take us into the handlers that we've registered and so on up to the app DB. In the restate data flow, the events flow into our state chart and they first are handed to the active leaf state or states and bubble up if necessary, but eventually they come out of the state chart via the actions that are invoked and that is what talks to the app DB. Let's talk about implementation a little bit. In Reframe, the way we do this is the state chart itself is the only thing that calls register handler. The state chart is the only thing that directly app accesses the app DB. The state chart overrides dispatch to implement event bubbling. The state chart in order to work maintains a static tree of the states declared and a dynamic set of active states. We'll have a look at active states when we actually run our little app. Designing a state chart is a bit different from what we're used to in our REPL. Uh, we want to start at the high level state chart. It's more of a top down thing. So we'll take a look at that. Here's our calculator again. Um, think about it in terms of events, conditions, states, and actions. At this level, we're not concerned with the complexity of the actions themselves. Those are merely side effects taking place in the IO monad. We focus on controlling when those actions are performed. If this were a multi-screen app, we'd probably use the screens as the top level states. The calculator app has only one screen. So the next choice is often the modes of operation. So that's what we'll consider here. We want to identify the events that will cause the app to change modes. So, when we first start up the app, the, uh, the app is in a state where it's looking to collect the first operand. And eventually it will move into a state where it's looking to hear what the operator is and then the second operand, and then it will wish to be prompted for a result to take it into the state where it's displaying the result. So we can see that certain events, as indicated in this chart, take us from one state to another. In the initial state, the operand one state, we'll be collecting digits usually, perhaps uh, a dot. But as soon as we hear uh, an operator come in, we enter the next state and so on. So this is, this is our initial cut at it. 
Um, another principle of designing state charts shows us how to use refactoring. Note that uh, the clear button takes us into the operand one state from every single state. So we can quickly refactor that in this way. We apply state nesting. We make one super state over all of these and we have it do a self transition when the, the cancel event is received. This takes advantage of the bubbling to implement it. And um, it also accomplishes the same result. The reason that it's a self transition on operand one or on calc itself rather than on on rather than an internal transition within operand one or calc is because we do want the entry action into operand one to be executed. That's the one that resets everything to our initial state. So we see that in the left hand picture, uh, our initial state is operand one and our clear operation from operand one is, is a self transition. In the refactored version, the self transition takes us back into calc and our initial state of that is operand one. So there is where the operand one entry actions would be performed. Um, the operand one and operand two states are themselves have internal structure and we're gonna look at that now. They have internal structure because they are themselves state machines. When we're doing state charts, a state machine is itself a state. So when we talk about leaf states, if the overall machine should happen to be in the operand one state at any one time, uh, its leaf state is one of these internal states of the operand machine. Let's see some code or rather some data. Okay, here on the right, we have our quantum calc application. It's running in React Native as guided by Xcode and this data structure, which is the state chart of the application. So we have our calculator. This thing at the top, unfortunately, here. Until yesterday, this was a normal alert pop-up, but in the debug mode of React Native, this thing started hanging the entire application. In fact, hanging the entire iPhone simulator. And I believe I saw a timeout on an Akamai URL during that. So interestingly enough, you're being spied upon even when developing <laughs> native applications. Okay, so this, uh, substitutes for the alert pop-up. Uh, I can, okay, let's start from the beginning. Here, here at the bottom, we show the currently active states. So our app is in the on state, our calc is in the start state. Alert is being treated as, a, as an orthogonal concurrent component. It wasn't necessary for the alert thing to be a state machine in itself. But that was just done as, a, as an aid to myself to demonstrate the design principles involved. Mm. So I start off, I put in a nine, let's say, and we see the current states have changed. Calc is now in the operand one state, which itself has a substate int. If I were to hit a decimal point, it takes operand one into the frac state. And so on, 9.6 plus uh, five equals, now we're in the result state and we're displaying the result. If I were to hit, um, let's say clear and say nine plus six times, I'm unable to do that. Uh, the reason is that uh, in the state I was in, I was uh, unable to accept another operator. So here we have the, the state chart. 
that we were looking at just before. What I've done just now is I've said nine plus six times, no good. Because uh, operand one, the plus takes us to op entered, the six takes us to operand two, and there's no transition from that for another operator. Let's see what we can do about that. What I want to implement is a slightly augmented state chart that has this pink transition in it. So I grab a little pre-prepared code that I've saved and I insert it into my state chart right here. I'll explain what I'm doing. Here's our calc state machine. These are the actions. We're not going to pay attention to those right now. Here are the trend. Oh, let's look at the states, of course. We have a start state, which is not declared in this diagram. But so I've augmented it just a bit for my own implementation purposes. But we have operand one, op entered, operand two, and result. Operand one has a sub state machine. Operand two has a sub state machine. Those two are implemented in an identical way. Here is our operand X state machine, which conforms to the diagram I showed you earlier. And we create operand one and operand two with a simple clone method, clone function that, that I provide. Uh, what we had here was um, transitions for operator entered coming out of the operand one state, that's the one that takes us to op enter. Coming out of the result state, that's the one that takes us from result back to, I'm sorry, it takes us from result back to op entered. And the one we've just added operates in the operand two state. The operator entered in the operand two state will take us back to the op entered state the pink transition that I've added. So now what I can do is now having, having hopefully observed FigWheel and Xcode and the packager and everything in the tool chain reload the app, I should be able to say nine minus four times two equals. So what have I done? Have I added any if statements? Have I added any code? No, I've just added a bit of data into this data structure. Mm. I'd like to show another modification because let's start over, let's clear and do something else. Five times minus four minus, oh no, I've forgotten to include uh, uh, the very thing that I was complaining about in the dumb calculator. What I want to do now is add a transition down here. I want to be able to accept a negative operand two, which means in the op entered state, I want the minus to signal that I've started the second operand. So I have some more code to slap right in here. And this goes here. What does it look like? It's the same trigger operator entered, but now I want it to operate in the op entered state. Uh, I only want to do this if the operator happens to be a minus. So I have a condition. The condition actually takes the same function signature as the um, actions that you perform on a database in reframe. Uh, its difference in form is that it does not have to return the database. It's returning a Boolean. So what I've done here is if the value is actually the minus sign, I proceed with the operation. It takes us into the operand two state and it does some bookkeeping, some side effects in the actions. There's one other thing I need to add just because of my implementation. And I need to notify, 
operand two to do the right thing from its start state for a minus sign. And that goes right here. I save it. I watch the uh, app reload. Coming, coming. And now I can say nine. I can say nine. I have a problem. Maybe I reload it again. I say nine. Oh, I'm sorry, I left a comment mark in. I say nine times minus four equals. And I've added this functionality by slipping in a few bits of data into my structure. Here's the references. Leave them on screen for a moment. And the final slide. I'd like to thank Slide Rule Software who supported some of this work. They make an awesome calendar app and planning app for iOS. And the repo for my code is GitHub node name stately. Thanks a lot. Are there any questions? No? All right. Thanks very much. Oh, there is a question. Have you thought about animating the state machines? I would love to animate the state machines. That's a wonderful idea. I've tried to animate some other algorithms. And um, I think with, with ClojureScript and with React, it should be a lot of fun to do that. Have you experimented with storing these charts in Datomic? No, not yet. Um, is there a way to generate these at higher levels of abstraction? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Eric? It's very wordy. Oh, yes. Um, the data structure could use some work. Um, in fact, to be honest, the, uh, uh, the events should be registered as, as trigger state pairs rather than as uh, triggers alone. Uh, that would be more in keeping with the state chart philosophy and it would simplify the data structures as well. There's various things going on here uh, that need a little tidying up. Here's the way the tree, the static tree of possible states is represented. Uh, it's a map and everything has a nil if it's a, if it's a leaf state. Um, the reason it's a map is because I thought that 
I would need to put some data where these nils are, but in fact, I don't. So uh, I'd like to convert this to uh, a nested vector structure instead. Uh, I know, Eric says, I know there's a sense of inclusion of superstates, but there could be other types of relationships. I'm not sure uh, what other types. I mean, we do have the, uh, the concurrent regions. So it's just a pair, you say. What's just a pair? It's a tree. Well, I'll hang out for the remainder of the time if any more questions come up. Or if Eric wants to clarify his question further. Oh, Eric says, uh, you said something was just a pair, but I missed what that was. Um, when, when executing the state chart, um, the proper thing to do is to look up to see if a transition is registered for a pair representing the trigger that was provided and the current state. Um, the way this data structure is organized at the moment, uh, the, the key is just the trigger. And then we have to go down through the start state of the various branches to see uh, what's legal at this point. Can you run multiple versions of these state charts simultaneously? That is, with an update, leave the user in the old version until it comes out of the state. Uh, I'm not clear about what version means in, in your question, Mike, Michael. This would make storing them in data script very powerful. I want to hear more about that. Please, please elaborate. Updating only leaves of the state chart, he means. Uh, I'm still not too clear what the question's about. Okay, on Twitter. <laughs> Great, I look forward to discussing this with you on Twitter. <laughs> We've got about two minutes left. No, no, I'm sorry. We've got about five or six minutes left. It's a little weird, it's silent. <laughs> Jeff Romaine comments, there used to be a real-time tool that included animated hierarchical state machines, perhaps iLogix. Cool, probably expensive, right?
Should I play some music? <laughs> All right, admin says, uh, any more questions? Thanks for the great talk. Uh, so I guess we're wrapping up. Great. Ha <laughs> ha.